Hello and welcome to episode 7 of Making a Killing, the podcast from Hudson Institute's Kleptocracy Initiative on how corruption is reshaping global politics. I'm Nate Sibley, a Hudson Research Fellow, and your guide on this journey into the darker corners of the global economy. Joining me to talk about the latest developments this week are my co-hosts, Congressional Policy Advisor Paul Massaro and the journalist and researcher Casey Michelle. In particular, we'll be discussing recent news of Rudy Giuliani's alleged foreign entanglements, as well as the most recent example of so-called libel tourism, when alleged kleptocrats try to suppress scrutiny by suing reporters and researchers for defamation. After that, I talked to Paul about how powerful authoritarian regimes like China have co-opted the language of international anti-corruption agreements to crack down on political opponents and critics, and how a legislative push in Congress could help the US recapture this narrative for democracies as well as help us to respond faster with anti-corruption support for vulnerable societies at critical moments when it could make all the difference between a successful transition to democracy and lapsing back into corrupt authoritarian rule. Well, hello and welcome to the uh, news and uh, d- policy developments uh, part of the programme. Uh, joining me as always, uh, Casey Michelle, researcher and journalist, and Paul Massaro, uh, congressional policy advisor. Big news uh, this week was that former Trump lawyer Rudy Giuliani's apartment was raided by US law enforcement as part of the ongoing investigation into his business activities in Ukraine. Uh, agents also searched the, f- the home of Victoria Tonzing a lawyer and associate of Giuliani's who also counts Ukrainian oligarch Dmitry Firtash among her clients. Firtash himself is currently resisting extradition to the United States on unrelated bribery charges. We'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Um, in Russia, Alexei Navalny ended his hunger strike and was seen for the first time since his sentencing on television in emaciated condition. Uh, Russian authorities are trying to designate his anti-corruption foundation as an extremist group uh, as part of a sweeping crackdown on what remains of independent media. Uh, with organisations like Medusa and Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty also uh, being per- persecuted. Uh, in London, uh, several uh, Russian oligarchs uh, or tycoons or businessmen or wh- whatever we're call- calling them these days uh, have joined Russian uh, Roman Abramovich's uh, law- uh, defamation lawsuit against the journalist Catherine Belton, who's author of Putin's People. They suggest that the, the, the way she characterises the way that they, they acquired and spent their wealth um, that was not accurate. Uh, we can talk a bit, a bit more about that in a minute. Moving to Lebanon, uh, the central bank governor uh, has been uh, is the subject of a legal complaint in France over suspicious, uh, alleged suspicious uh, real estate purchases. Um, France also moved to join the United States in sanctioning several major uh, Lebanese uh, political figures uh, for their for their role in the country's uh, mismanagement and economic uh, decline. South Africa, President Cyril Ramaphosa, sorry appear before investigators as part of a sprawling corruption case uh, that many view as a battle for the soul of the country's governing African National Congress Party. He came to power on promises to root out corruption after around $33 billion was alleged to have vanished from state coffers during the tenure of his predecessor, Jacob Zuma, uh, who is not, uh, by all accounts, cooperating uh, with the investigation, uh, as, as you might expect. So anyway, um, moving back to kind of the top uh, headline, Casey, as a, as a, as a journalist... You were very much covered uh, and were invo- kind of involved in the um, the whole Rudy Giuliani saga. Um, so, so it's it's pretty complicated if you're just kind of coming, if you didn't have the energy to read about all this stuff at the time, as I often didn't. I wonder if you could kick us off by just explaining, you know, what, it, what, what how does all this fit together? Um, what was what was Rudy doing in Ukraine? Uh, and just a real sort of Rudy Ukraine 101 for, for our listeners. Uh, yeah, Nate, thanks for that, uh, that question. Obviously, thanks for the rundown. It has been yet another packed series of days and weeks at this point regarding all the kinds of news uh, and developments on the anti-corruption and counter-kleptocracy front. I mean, coming at this uh, as a journalist, coming at this as an American, coming at this as somebody that watched the series of developments uh, in Washington in the past few years to say nothing of the uh, uh, impacts on relations between Washington uh, and Ukraine the last few years regarding former President Donald Trump, regarding uh, former New York mayor and then Trump's lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, and then obviously regarding all of the details and uh, uh, the, 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 the broad sordid saga 
of Trump's uh, first impeachment, um, I think back in 2019 and early 2020, you know, the news that came out last week that American authorities had gotten to the point to the point where they felt comfortable uh, not only publicly identifying Rudy Giuliani as a figure uh, in the sprawling investigations into the broader questions about how certain figures out of Ukraine were targeting American politicians, were infiltrating American politics, and were attempting attempting to upend American policy and even more broadly the American election of 2020. The news that American authorities not only felt comfortable targeting Giuliani, but then going to the next step of actually raiding his apartment, raiding his offices, gaining access to electric communications, gaining access to emails, to text messages, to phone records, uh, as well as obviously going forward and uh, pursuing similar means uh, regarding another uh, American lawyer, a woman named Victoria Tenzing, who, as you mentioned, was the uh, the lawyer for Ukrainian oligarch Dmitry Firtash. You know, th this is difficult to overstate just how welcome and just how important this is for any number of topics. You know, to take just just one basic one, one of the terms or terms of art that we have seen rise to prominence over the last two, three years here in the U.S. and the broader West is something called strategic corruption. Uh, there's a wonderful article in Foreign Affairs from a number of co-authors that came out last year attempting to detail what strategic corruption is, who it's being used by, and how it operates. Uh, and lo and behold, so much of what they determined as it pertains to what strategic corruption actually is just so happens to have a whole wide range of overlap with kleptocracy itself, with what we know about how kleptocrats use their money, move their money, hide their money, launder their money, and then eventually spend their money. And it's that point where they spend their money that we see the intersection of strategic corruption because again the kind of elevator pitch or rudy giuliani 101 of what we know he was trying to do what his partners were trying to do and those in ukraine who he was working with were trying to do was use and utilize these means of strategic uh, elements of strategic corruption that is to say off the books payments anonymous financing laundered funds all of which just so happened to track back to one or then a number Number of Ukrainian oligarchs, including most especially Mr. Furtosh, who is uh, has been charged by the U.S. Uh, with uh, um, uh, uh, or, or on a bribery charge and is awaiting extradition from Vienna back to the U.S. What we know at this point is that Mr. Furtosh was using and was utilizing. Uh, the kleptocratic networks, these off the books, books payments, these services, and in Giuliani's case, these enabling professionals, these Western lawyers, these Western figures that use things like attorney client privilege, privilege that use things like um, uh, behind the scenes conversations to, in Furtosh's case, get these bribery charges lifted to, in Furtosh's case, uh, be able to access the highest levels of American power, of American policymaking, and of the American political spectrum. So at its basis core, what we know that Mr. Furtosh and his network were doing was using and utilizing these American figures, those like Giuliani, those like a number of other American lawyers, those like a number of other um, uh, Ukrainian American or Belarusian American figures to try to access the highest levels of power in the U.S. to upend American policy, to upend, as we saw in the 2020 election, American democracy. Now, there's a wide range of figures that were involved. There are a wide number of developments that were involved. But at the end of the day, the fact that the American authorities have now gotten to the point where they can go after, and again, these are all allegations that it hasn't been proven in court, and Mr. Giuliani, if the charges do come, will see his due day in court. But the fact that we've gotten to this point is an absolutely fantastic development for the rule of law in the U.S., for U.S. standing as it pertains to emphasizing the rule of law elsewhere, uh, and as it pertains to beating back or countering these networks of strategic corruption that, again, rely on kleptocratic mechanisms, uh, uh, looting, laundering, stashing, and then spending those laundered monies uh, to attempt to upend, to attempt to infiltrate, and to uh, uh, attempt to uh, impact in ways we will never know about uh, democratic processes, American democracy writ large. And all of this is to say nothing of the impact 
impact that it has on American Ukrainian relations, which as we know, over the last few years, we're at an absolute uh, nadir, we're at an absolute low point that we can now begin building up. And I, I just want to quote one of um, uh, you know uh, my friends, Melinda Herring, at the Atlantic Council. You know, we, we were talking about this online. Again, I was saying what a wonderful day it is for broader counter-kleptocracy efforts. And she made the excellent point that it's not only a fantastic day and development for that, but also for Ukraine, also for justice, and also for broader American standing abroad. And, and she is exactly right. Now we can go into the, oh yeah, go ahead, Paul. Casey, I just, well, I just wanted to, to talk about, you know, I guess the, 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 the difference here between strategic corruption and kleptocracy, because I think actually understanding these and the nexus of these is very important to understand like the broader national security threat of kleptocracy, because I think you make a very important distinction, and that is that, in a sense, strategic corruption is possible because of the enabling kleptocratic environment. Without and, 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 and in order to fight that environment, you have to go after that environment. So I guess I just want to flag that while this isn't a, you know, a welcome development, while it is really important that you have what, you know, in some senses, catastrophic care in healthcare terms, you need the preventive care too. And that's something that we don't, we haven't yet really seen. That's what that's what sort of banning anonymous shell companies might be. That's what uh gatekeeper anti-money laundering obligations might be. You know, that's what that's what we need to see. That's when when we when we're talking about a treasury's war on kleptocracy, what we're talking about is starting to go after the systemic issues. This is essentially like DOJ's job, right? And that is to say, go after the bad guys once they've actually done the crimes, right? But but we definitely need to be able to step back too and say, hey, this is a case study of how bad guys use the kleptocratic network to undermine US national security. But this is one of many, many, many cases. Well, exactly. That's a really good point. And, you know, um, should say, uh, should have said at the start, Mr. Furtash, Mr. Giuliani, Ms. Tenzing all strongly deny any wrongdoing in this case. Uh, and even if even if they turn out to be correct and they're all completely innocent uh, of, of doing anything um, untoward here, it is an, an amazing case study of, e even if you don't believe the allegations, even if they turn out to be proven false, it's an amazing case study of the vulnerabilities uh, that we have, the systemic vulnerabilities. And so I think you're, you're both absolutely right to, to flag that, um, that we should learn. You know, we have an attitude that when things get struck down in court or thrown out, that's the end of the matter. But what we need to start doing, I think, as societies is learning uh, from, from, from you know, the, the potential threat that is there as well. Because, you know, we've, this is such a high profile case because of, you know, it involved the president of the United States. Giuliani is a, an extremely colourful character, very easy to put in newspapers. But this kind of inf infiltration, this corrosion of professional standards and values is going on all day, every day in law firms, in banks, in public affairs firms, all, all, all across the developed world, or in every major financial center. That's right. That's right, Nate. And I think this brings us very naturally to that, that second piece of news you'd flagged on these, these Russian oligarchs who've brought this lawsuit uh, uh, to silence a journalist, a very prominent journalist who published a very prominent book, Putin's People, and the, the journalist, of course, Catherine Belton. And this is, a, this is the same kind of kleptocratic enabling environment. And even if this lawsuit is thrown out, and even if it's at the end of the day proves superfluous, and even if they don't win or whatever, they'll have successfully in many ways already proven their point. They'll shut down other journalists that don't want to get sanctioned. They may be able to drain uh, 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 Catherine of of Catherine Belton of, um, of of her finances, of her wealth, of her money. Get it just get to the point where she can no longer even defend herself in court. And we we've even seen this before uh, in the resourcing argument of the fact that. You know, when when cases are brought, DOJ brings cases, or the uh, um, uh, this the Serious Crimes Agency in, in the UK, is, Serious Fraud Office brings cases, and the National Crime Agency, and all that kind of stuff. They actually there there are points at court where they just cannot continue fighting because they run out of money, and that's this is this is this kind of mode. This is this this is this environment that enables this sort of thing. Uh, and and as you point out, the, this these lawsuits are being brought through UK law firms, of course, right? So there's there's a UK enabling aspect to this. Um, so no matter what happens, in many ways, these oligarchs have already won, given 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 that they brought this, given that they, they can silence it like this, and given that they'll silence other journalists by doing this. So just to flag the sort of policy issue we're talking about here, in the United States, we call it, uh, it's, a, it's a great name, it's a SLAP, a Strategic Lawsuit Against Public Participation which is a bit of a mouthful. And in the UK, uh, they're often, you know, you might hear it called a vexatious lawsuit. And the idea is uh, to bring a legal action that doesn't have any actual or doesn't have uh, substantial legal merit. Uh, but the, o the object is to, is to kind of crush your, your opponent uh, by crippling them with legal costs and threats 
and injunctions to get their books, uh, you know, like so that people can't sell them anywhere. Again, we, um, you know, this is this is case has not been decided. It's still very much, you know, so they they may they may well be proven completely right. Perhaps Catherine Belton's completely wrong. Uh, I think most people who know Catherine Belton's work would find that extremely surprising. Uh, perhaps all, all I should say for now, uh, given that that case is still live. Also, would go so far as to just, you know express my solidarity with her because if you work on kleptocracy issues, you do get letters uh, from lawyers, you do get letters from uh, PR firms, gently reminding you of how powerful. Uh, their clients are. Yeah. Um, Casey, did you have any thoughts? You're a journalist. You must have uh, had some exposure to this world as well. Yeah, yes, absolutely. And again, as I mentioned in, in conversations past, I'm incredibly fortunate to be working as an American journalist in an American context, enjoying obviously the broad protections that the First Amendment provides. Nonetheless, having seen over the past four, five, six, seven years, those protections, these kinds of anti slap provisions, as you just mentioned, Nate, in the US, nonetheless being targeted, nonetheless in certain states and in certain, certain instances being weakened, which is why we see increasing discussion in Washington which Paul can obviously speak on as it pertains to some kind of federal effort at shoring up those protections. That is to say, a federal anti-slap statute. Again, these are all uh, in preliminary discussions right now. Nothing has been passed as of yet. And I just wanted to make to your to your point, Nate, two, two quick follow-on points. One, that is that the developments we've seen regarding these oligarchs targeting Catherine Belton, and again, can't recommend her book uh, uh, enough, and certain to say nothing of her own uh, work previous to that, her own investigative um, publishing. This is a pattern that is not new. This is a pattern that we have seen play out for years and years, especially in the British context. And Nate, to your point that even if, or maybe it was Paul, your point, even if these oligarchs are found um, uh, uh, guilty, that is to say, even if they lose the case in and of itself, they have nonetheless proven that they are willing to take these cases to court. They are willing to spend uh, as much money as they can to make these journalists' lives and these publishers' lives and these outlets' lives absolutely miserable, wasting time, wasting resources on, as Nate said, these vexatious lawsuits. And I think back uh, five, six, seven years ago now to the late Karen Dawisha's book, Putin's Kleptocracy, which is, again, obviously a wonderful book and really in many ways got the ball rolling on these discussions that we are having now. Uh, that book was initially dropped by its publisher, Cambridge University Press, because of not a lawsuit in and of itself, but because of concerns about yes. a lawsuit. That is to yes. say, it wasn't even filed. It was just that it could be filed, that Cambridge University Press dropped that. It was eventually published um, uh, by an American publisher, again, enjoying the fruits of the First Amendment protections. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right, Casey. And, that's, and that, is, that is the danger. That is, that is that the damage is already done in many ways, just in that this was, this was filed. So uh, I guess two, two things on that, two like policy response items. And that is, like you say, the federal slap law, anti-slap law. And that's that's something that you know I, I am looking into. That's something I'd also welcome our listeners to email me on if you have you know model laws, states of past laws, other countries of past laws. Like, I mean, where where has this worked? You know, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, I'm in preliminary research on this sort of thing. Um, and then I guess too, of course, and that's you know these lawyers themselves. Where are the obligations for them? I mean, I mean, it is it is without a doubt if they are accepting money from four Russian oligarchs, they are accepting blood money. They're accepting money that's been stolen from the Russian people. How is that okay? Everyone, everyone has a right to representation. Fair. I agree with that. But lawyers do not have a right to accept blood money. And what is, Paul, to that point, what is the connective tissue between the Giuliani case and the case of the Russian oligarch suing Belton? It is the Western lawyers providing their services without going through any of the means of the necessary due diligence recommended by groups like the Financial Action Task Force or in the U.S., the DOJ itself, as we know with the Giuliani Furtosh case. Giuliani, Tenzing, her husband, Joe DiGenova, who also uh, worked on behalf of Furtosh, none of them uh, filed any reports, any details whatsoever with the DOJ's Foreign Agents Registration Act. They were citing what exists as a legal loophole, but that loophole is very constricted. That loophole is very narrow. And as we know from public reporting, their work, their services went beyond what that loophole allowed, even though, again, they didn't register any of that information uh, with the DOJ itself. So we will be watching this very, very closely as it moves forward. And certainly uh, we'll be thinking of and supporting Catherine Belton as she moves forward with these vexatious lawsuits themselves. Okay. And, and so I suppose lastly, before we move on to talk, uh, Paul, about some of the stuff going on in Congress, um, just thinking to, back to the event we held at Hudson Institute a couple of weeks ago with interim president Juan Guaido uh, and com his, his economic crime commissioner, Carlos Paparoni, on how the Maduro regime 
brought Venezuela to its knees in recent years. Um, this is a country, should, it was the wealthiest country in South America. Um, it's had its, its uh, oil wealth uh, stripped out by successive corrupt uh, uh, political elites. It got me thinking in terms of, uh, you know, the process by which we who live in major financial centres where stolen money often ends up, penthouses in Miami, uh, supercars in London, you know, um, investments in New York, whatever it is, how when we seize that money, we return it uh, to the people from whom it was originally stolen. You mentioned, Paul, the, the blood money that's uh, now being paid to law firms um, that really belongs to the people of Russia, perhaps. And so um, I've also been talking to a number of Venezuelan groups this week about that. And um, Paul, before we move on to talk about the big uh, sort of congressional uh, action uh, over the past couple of weeks, um, last year there was a there was a there was a bill called the Justice for Victims of Kleptocracy Act, which would have introduced a bit more transparency into the way that the U.S. Uh, holds money that it's taken from kleptocrats and tries to return it to the people from whom it was stolen. Um, this week, uh, Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio brought out kind of a related bill, uh, specifically in the Venezuelan uh, context. Uh, that would create a special fund uh, for the Venezuelan people, a Ven- Venezuela Restoration Fund, I think it is. What this would do is, is exactly, it would, it, would, it would create a fund at Treasury where any money taken from Chavista kleptocrats would be held in trust for the Venezuelan people. It would be protected from creditors, blood lawyers, vulture funds, and so on and so forth, who often come after this money. Paul, do you, do you want to just um, explain a bit about what the, uh, the Justice for Victims of Kleptocracy Act would do? Because that's, that's coming back soon, right? Yes, yes, yes. uh, Reintroduced in this Congress uh, uh, very soon, we hope. And uh, of course, it's a very, very short piece of legislation. And the idea here is simply to mandate that the Department of Justice put uh, on its website, publicly accessible, uh, you know, how, uh, what quantity by country of assets that were hidden in the United States and recovered by uh, U.S. law enforcement, the United States certainly currently has. And we'll, we'll do this under the banner uh, you know, money stolen from the Venezuelan people and recovered by the United States, and money stolen from the Ukrainian people and recovered by the United States. And the reason to do this, of course, uh, is as you say, uh, you know, there's there's a there's sort of a lack of transparency in this space, simply in terms of how much money does the United States actually have that it's recovered, how much money is sitting around being, you know, awaiting return. Uh, but at the same time, there's a related concern that I'm very sympathetic to that you, you know, you can't simply return this money to a regime that's going to steal it all over again. So you need to find ways to signal to the people that we stand, that these these foreign peoples, that we stand with them, that the United States stands with the victims of kleptocracy, that we you know, have set up this incredible um, kleptocracy asset recovery initiative at DOJ and are, and are recovering these funds and intend to give them back, uh, but, but you know, cannot do it. It would be morally wrong to do it until such a time as we can give them back with sort of reasonable standards of transparency and rule of law. Casey, we're about to lose you because you've got to jump on a flight. So did you have any thoughts on this this other side of kleptocracy, which we haven't really looked into yet on the podcast, which is how do you get this money back to the people it was stolen from? That's what, Otherwise, why are we bothering doing it at all in the first place? Yeah, that's exactly right, Nate. You know, asset recovery is one thing. Asset returning is a whole different beast in and of itself. And there are any number of conversations, any number of concerns, and any number of prior examples. Some successes previously, as in the case of Kazakhstan, but far more cases in which it has been difficult, if not impossible, to actually figure out how to and to whom you should return these funds. You know, I think of the ongoing discussions between the U.S. and the government in Uzbekistan right now regarding hundreds of millions of dollars seized regarding the corruption um, schemes and scams of the former first daughter of the um, uh, uh, Uzbek government, uh, government Gulnar Karimova. And these this discussions have been going on for years. How can the West, how can the US, how can the Swiss, how can the others return these funds knowing that they won't be, or with, with assurances that they won't be simply stolen, pillaged, uh, looted, uh, and laundered yet again for you uh, to be used by yet another regime, yet another figure, yet another group of individuals that are relying on these kleptocratic mechanisms that again are relying on these Western secrecy services, these Western financial services, Western enablers, those like the lawyers, those like the accountants, those like the consultants, to run these same schemes and scams all over again. It is a difficult and uphill battle. And I will say, just as a final point, Nate, I am very, very glad that you and your colleagues, uh, to say nothing of Paul and his colleagues on the Hill, are taking increased attention to the means and mechanisms with which the Maduro regime in Caracas has been pillaging the people of Venezuela for years and years. And it is long past time that when we conceive of what a kleptocracy in terms of a single regime consists of, we no longer think of only Putin's Russia or Aliyev's Azerbaijan or Rahmon's Tajikistan or uh, you know, Dos Santos regime uh, formerly in Angola, 
but we include and extend that to Maduro's regime in, in Venezuela. It doesn't matter if it is a rightist, nationalist, authoritarian regime. It doesn't matter if it is a military dictatorship elsewhere. As we have seen in Maduro's case, they can uh, uh, frame themselves as a, a socialist utopia, as a leftist government writ large that nonetheless works and, and uses the same means, the same mechanisms for the same ends that these other governments in Moscow or in Baku or in Dushanbe are doing themselves. And it's long past time that we understand and recognize the Maduro regime for the kleptocracy that it is. Casey, thank you so much. Uh, I believe you've got to go and uh, jump on a flight now because you're joining us uh, on a sort of extended travel schedule. It's a, a nice sign that things are opening up again here, here in the US. So thanks for your time. Slowly but surely, I'm happy to be able to join from my childhood bedroom, and I'll be uh, back in New York in no time. <laughs> See you then. Okay, Paul, so some great news uh, for you and the Helsinki Commission, and all the, all the congressional officers have been working on this, but uh, the, the Countering Russian and Other Overseas Kleptocracy, yes, that's the Crook Act. Uh, I don't know what genius came up uh, with that acronym. I suspect I'm looking at him right now. Passed through committee uh, last week, uh, which means it's now headed, uh, hopefully at some point, to the floor of the US Congress for a vote, as it came so tantalizingly close to doing last year. Uh, we've already mentioned the Justice for Victims of Kleptocracy Act, but in terms of stuff that's coming down the pipeline from the US in terms of anti-corruption uh, reform, this is perhaps uh, the next big thing for people to keep an eye on. Could you tell us what the Crook Act is uh, and what its major provisions are? So the Crook Act, of course, is a big bicameral, bipartisan Helsinki uh, effort here. Uh, led in the House by uh, Representatives Keating and Fitzpatrick, and in the Senate by Senators uh, Cardin and Wicker, so Democrat and Republican in either chamber. And the idea here is to really view corruption for what it is, global corruption for what it is, that is a national security threat. And that's, that's I guess, one big piece of the bill is simply the framing, the normative framing, the finding section, some of the non-operative pieces, just acknowledging and saying and putting it in the U.S. code mm -hmm. that corruption is a national security threat and the policy of the United States is to stand with the victims of kleptocracy and is to fight these corrupt dictatorships, these kleptocracies, right? So that's a big part of the bill in and of itself and to say, look, we've got this big anti-corruption architecture around the world, which, you know, we should talk about sometime on the podcast, the, this, mm -hmm. this lovely, wonderful set of commitments that rarely, if ever, get enforced yep. in most countries, you know, but they exist, um, and that we should be looking at these, we should be holding countries to these, we should be thinking about all of this in terms of the existential threat it is to the United States. So that's a that's a big part of the bill. Now, there's also very very important that changes the narrative, the bill. which is important. Like you know, it's it is we important. do need reforms, but we also need uh, just to get this stuff set down in print because at the moment we're really not incorporating and putting it at the center of our foreign policy. In fact, I really think it's half the battle. I, I I really don't think you win without a narrative change. You can do all the policy you want in the world, but until those lawyers, right, until those accountants uh, uh, won't work for kleptocrats like they wouldn't work for Soviets back in mm -hmm. back in the Cold War, we just cannot win, right? I mean, they'll always be looking for the next loophole. They'll always be looking for the way around the law. So, so there's the law. There's the stuff that's you know in in the code, and then there's the enforcement of it, which is never going to be enough. Mm -hmm. It could definitely be better, but it's never going to be enough to really create like the deterrence effect it needs to create. There also needs to be uh, uh, the narrative element that just like like. If if you're a lawyer and you're talking with your lawyer friend, you're saying, "Hey, I got this great oligarch client or whatever." That lawyer should look at you and say, "Whoa, man, you shouldn't be doing that." You know, that's 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 against democracy. That's against the rule of law. It's against human rights. That's when we've won. That's that's that that's the level we need to get to. That's a, quite a ways away still because we still have a huge uh, professional establishment working for these guys. So 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 anyway, that's very important. That narrative element. So then we get into the. Um, the, the operative elements. And I'll start with, with the, the operative elements that are uh, uh, a little bit easier to explain. The first is the creation of an, uh, an interagency anti-corruption task force. Uh, so this is really getting all the agencies together, uh, making this a major priority within the administration. Everybody that's got a piece of this puzzle, which we really see is practically everybody with a foreign policy role, and sort of saying, okay, we need a strategy. Come up with a strategy. We need to coordinate. We need to have a whole of government approach on this. And of course, Congress is part of that as well. That's if I may just quickly for our European listeners who are used to sort of being in a fairly small country with a centralized government, uh, a unitary government, um, that, that it's sometimes hard to comprehend the extent to which the US federal government, different branch of it, pursue their own agendas, uh, do their own thing that they were set up to do perhaps 20 years ago, uh, which is not necessarily the most relevant thing and don't talk to each other. So these interagency things, institutionalizing interagency cooperation are really important and a big step forward. 
That's right. So that's one of the things we're going to do is institutionalize that. Uh, a second thing we're going to do is ensure that every mandate, that every single embassy have an anti-corruption point of contact. So this would not be a new person necessarily, but it would be you know a, a, a person that has responsibility for uh, for fighting corruption in the country, for looking at illicit financial flows, for 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 looking at strategic corruption, right? For thinking about corruption as a national security threat, and that's another really important way. Uh, to change the narrative, to put it in the work stream, mm -hmm. to ensure that this is a part of the discussion, right? So that's that's another big thing to build us. And then finally, we come to you know what is what is takes a little bit longer to explain, but is the real sort of meat uh, of the bill, and that is this anti-corruption action fund. So the anti-corruption action fund is based on a lot of discussion and research that one of the problems with uh, U.S. efforts to build the rule of law abroad uh, in the past decades has been missing these windows of opportunity, all right? So when a new reformer comes to power, a lot of US aid and US technical assistance is, is sort of trapped in these multi-year programs mm -hmm. around the world. They're in the wrong place. Insofar as we can surge stuff in, it's usually limited. Um, and we miss really the one window where you can make change. And that's, and that's kind of like the truth of a lot of these reforms is if you don't move fast and really sort of big bang approach as some of the scholars call it, uh, you, then the old guard will reassert itself very easily. Uh, I mean, a lot of a lot of rule of law programs for the last thirty years have been, a, you know, very sadly a failure in large part because they've been very technocratic, focused long term on the judiciary, getting the right words in the right mm -hmm. places and stuff like that. But as we see again and again and again with the abuse of anti corruption laws in Russia, the abuse of anti corruption laws in China, the abuse of judiciaries all over the world, if you can you can get them to say the right things, you can get them to say sort of. Oh, independence of the judiciary, independence. But 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 in reality, it may make no difference at all. And in reality, you may have even just give them a, a new toolbox to, to, to do further oppression, mm -hmm. which we've certainly seen in the Russian case, where they now use financial fraud laws to expropriate business, to chase people out of the country, all that kind of stuff. And they can even speak, now they can speak the language of Interpol and they can speak the language of the West. And then they use that to go after dissidents, right? So, I mean, there's there's been a, actually a counterproductive aspect of this. Well, the classic example there, just to jump in, was, you know, during the war on terror after 9-11, suddenly every authoritarian regime around the world knew that the Americans were not going to go after them if they dressed up whatever they were doing to pol political opposition and critics as anti-terrorism laws. And you still see That's that right. today. Uh, we mentioned earlier on that, uh, you know, uh, Alexei Navalny's uh, Anti-Corruption Foundation is, is in the process of being designated as an extremist, organ basically a terrorist organisation. And so this is absolutely, uh, and, and you know, we're now seeing the same sort of thing uh, with anti-corruption uh, stuff. This might be a bad take, but I think yes. inspired primarily by Xi Jinping uh, and his anti-corruption. All the authoritarians look at the way that he's imprisoned hundreds of thousands of corrupt officials, uh, and and they say like, well, I can do that, and it's and I can I can portray myself as a man of the people yes. by saying it's an anti-corruption drive, and it's actually just a shakedown of your enemies and a chance to shut them up. And, and it's true that the one thing all humans agree on is they all want to fight corruption. Mm -hmm. So dressing things up as like a like an anti-corruption thing is 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 really quite powerful. And you're right; you can portray yourself as a man of the people. Like I guess it I, shows I also how we've to... lost the narrative to authoritarian, right? So like they were following our narrative after the war, in the war on terror. They're now following perhaps the, uh, China's narrative of anti-corruption. Yes. Uh, and and they, that is viewed by people around the world as a, as a as a uh, Xi Jinping. Oh, look at that! He's he's a tough leader. He's a great guy. He's really thrown the yep. scumbags in jail. And look at the mess they're making in America, like all these corrupt lawyers running around. <laughs> Even some in the West buy it. I mean, this 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 uh, this Chinese anti-corruption narrative, which is just so clearly. Right. China going after political opponents, mm. you know. Um, and, well, it's mixed. So that, you know, the, 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 the doubtless there have been genuine, case, you know, because it's so rampant that, of course, probably most of the people thrown in jail perhaps are, were corrupt. Uh, but no, notably, it, Xi Jinping, they, they, them being thrown in jail often creates a promotion opportunity for one of Xi Jinping's uh, friends. Uh, so, so that's the way it kind of works. And, and your political opponents can also be corrupt. Mm -hmm. And what do you do when you have the that overlap, you know? So, I mean, there's, there's, anyway, this is, this is all a little tangential so, to, sure. the, to, the, to, the, to the bill, <laughs> but it is a very, very, very important point because I was, I was going to flag also that sort of the, this treaty under the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is of course this sort of uh, uh, autocrats only club, you know, mm -hmm. they have this, they have this treaty of uh, like the treaty against separatism, terrorism and extremism, <laughs> right? And it's like, it enables you to like request prisoner transfers you know, between these aut this autocratic club of countries to which like Russia and China both belong without due process, without anything like that. And I wouldn't be surprised if in the next few years we see like and corruption or whatever tacked on there, right? And and 
corrupt uh, individuals, because you're right. I mean, they, they using like taking that narrative uh, and then using it for oppression uh, is what we have to watch out for now. So it's good that we've got crook coming, mm -hmm. right? Because it, because it's really important that we keep uh, the anti-corruption narrative for what it is, you know, and build it, build it out to be something that democracy provides, democratic right. accountability, you know, the rule of law, things like that, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it has to be real. Um, so this anti-corruption action fund will hopefully go quite a ways uh, to helping us curb those sort of things. And what's very interesting about it is it will be funded with a surcharge on the worst FCPA violation. So uh, mm -hmm. this is a, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, just for our That's listeners. right. So yes, that's exactly right. And this is this is this is paying like a, a, a U.S. domiciled entity or listed company paying a bribe abroad. So this is essentially the U.S. commitment not to export corruption. And in fact, this is the law that Firtash is facing. Right. Uh, charges under so so for a, for a bribe paid in India. Mm -hmm. um, so this is this is all a very 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 interesting sort of uh, sort of thing. So what we're going to do is for for criminal violations above fifty million, we're going to charge an extra uh, five million, and that five million is going to go to this fund, and then it's going to sit there no year and just accumulate over time mm -hmm. until you have one of these historic windows of opportunity, in which case we can surge that funding in. Uh, and we're, we looked at, we crunched the numbers. It looks like it'll be about 16 million a year looking at the last 10 years. Um, and seeing as all of US uh, uh, rule of law aid is about 115 million a year, mm -hmm. uh, 16 million extra a year is pretty big, but then of course it won't be spent each year, right? No, it'll, it will accumulate, it'll accumulate it'll over time. So, so just, you talked about making it real, like the, the, these moments of historic opportunity, I think you said, could we have some sort of real examples of where this might have been deployed in the past where it could have been useful? The one that springs to mind uh, for me is obviously Ukraine, uh, the Maidan revolu uh, the, the revolution of dignity, sorry, in 2014. Uh, just maybe explain a bit about that. Any other uh, sort of country case examples just to bring it to life a bit? Yes, these happen again and again and again. Of course, the revolution of dignity would have been a huge one, right? That that's a place where we wish we could have surged. Mm -hmm. uh, the the Armenian Velvet Revolution, two thousand eighteen. You know, when you, when you really could have built up uh, anti corruption capacity, there was a real desire. Um, the Malaysia election. Mm -hmm. You know, we talked about one MDB on here before. You know, and that was the only reason the Malaysians have reopened that investigation is because they had this incredible democratic election in which uh, there was a total upset. Uh, the pro democracy party. Uh, one and like a, a, a completely unforeseen election. And then suddenly there was this huge opening, mm -hmm. you know, and it was like, okay, but like, where, where is the American assistance? So that's another place where you could really uh, use a fund like this. And it really, really come, you know, I mean, it seems like every few years. So you really would see, um, you know, this accumulation of funds over time and being able to like drop in, say $50 million mm -hmm. or something like that of like, we send over treasury experts, like like illicit finance experts. We send over. I was going to say this uh, DOJ this, experts. This presumably isn't sending fifty million dollars to the government of that country to implement anti-corruption reforms, because it, one might imagine it, it could easily go astray. So this is this is getting serious about this. It's sending U.S. experts technical assistance, technical assistance, law yes, enforcement assistance, assistance, presumably if if there are corruption cases involving U U.S. dollar. You, you, um, that's that's right. Technical assistance for the in the window of opportunity when you have the reformers that have the political will to make it. I mean, mm -hmm. this is this is the thing you that constantly. It's like it's like almost obnoxious. Constantly hear it in development circles of like like everybody's got the whole thing figured out except except political will. Like where's the political mm -hmm. will? You know, it's always like like oh the problem was political will, but how do you study political will? There's been this kind of revelation in anti-corruption as recent that corruption is not a technical issue. You can't solve it. Mm -hmm. Uh, with a technocratic approach. You must solve it with a political approach. So paying attention to politics, believe it or not, and it took us like, you know, it's 30 years after the end of the Cold War. And it's like, finally, we realized like, like, I mean, and I mean, to be fair, it took us a long time to even say the word corruption, right? The World Bank didn't even want right. to acknowledge that corruption was a development program problem. Um, so I mean, it's like, yeah, it took us a really long time to get here. But we're finally saying like, corruption is a political problem, which is like, 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 I mean, underlies everything, right? When we look at uh, 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 authoritarian kleptocracies. When we look at strategic corruption, this is all political. This is all politics. Right. This is not, Russia does not undermine its neighbors because they just don't have control of their technocratic system. Mm -hmm. And if they only had a technic, you know, the right technocratic approach, then they wouldn't undermine their neighbors with corruption. That's that's not true. You know, it's political. It's a choice. Um, so that's that kind of thing, that acknowledgement uh, is really huge. And that's what this, like fundamentally, that's the mindset change that Crook enables for U.S. Uh, development policy. So that is a revolution. 
Well, there we go. Lots to look forward to, and we'll keep you updated uh, on the on the progress of the Crook Act, which which we hope. Um, well, I'm not allowed to talk uh, endorse legislation as such. I could see our, our producer Phil smiling at me in the back background, um, but it's obviously fascinating, and I'm sure I hope our audience found that as interesting as I did. Uh, and we'll keep you updated on the progress of that and all the other, uh, in, uh, you know, um, exciting anti-kleptocracy stuff coming out of Washington these days. Uh, but that's about all we've got time for today. So uh, thanks for joining me, uh, Paul. Uh, thanks to Casey as well, even though he's, he's uh, on a plane by now, presumably. Uh, and I'll see you guys in a couple of weeks' time. My pleasure. See you later, Nate. I hope you enjoyed this week's show. Please don't forget to subscribe and share the podcast with your friends if you haven't done so already. And a five-star review on Apple Podcasts is really super helpful. I'm afraid that's it from Casey, Paul and me until next time, when we'll be back with more guests, interviews and expert insights into how corrupt authoritarians are quite literally making a killing.